Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin. This is uh, a talk sponsored by the Program on Constitutional Government, which is part of the Center for American Politics, which is part of the Great Great Green Government Department. And uh, our guest today is Morris. Everybody calls him Mo Fiorina from Stanford University, the political science department. He used to be here at Harvard, and before that he was at Stanford. Caltech. Caltech, okay. Uh, so he has a, a vast collection of wines, which is now, <laughs> which is now very well traveled. Having made it across the country twice, right? Um, he's uh, a doyen of uh, American uh, political science, I mean, American politics. Uh, on top of that, everybody likes him. He's an extremely <laughs> likable person, Mo. And um, it's partly because, uh, being libertarian, he's uh, not the principal enemy of either side. And, and so, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, no, and uh, everybody's hoping for that sort of, uh, his partial agreement will, will spread out or expand and become complete. So, um, but that's not why we have him. We have him because he's so uh, intelligent and accomplished. He's a family professor of political science. One of the uh, families, the Went family professor. So he's called and he's uh, written important books on important subjects. I mean, big subjects like divided government, which is 1992, the question of culture wars, the myth of a polarized America, that's 2005, and Disconnect, the Breakdown of Representation in America in 2009. And uh, he's uh, written uh, two very uh, interesting articles in a general sense, not done for political science journals, which we have distributed. So, Mo. Thank you, Harvey. That was very nice. And, and thank you all for coming today. When uh, Harvey explained to me that this was a heterogeneous audience, and I said, well, what, what would you like me to talk about? He gave me some suggestions, one of which was I could do a retrospective. And my first thought was, well, how could I possibly do a retrospective on such a vast body of work? Uh, and then it was, uh, it was sobering to realize that, yes, I could in 25 minutes, that that wasn't that hard. Uh, when you look back, you, you can see a clear path and uh, that could have gotten you from A to B, which is what I'll try to do today in a short time. Uh, but when you're actually doing it, you're taking the wrong exit, uh, you're detouring, uh, you're, you're simply not following that straight path. And uh, so I, I really think I can carry it off in about 25 minutes today. So let's begin. First of all, the breakdown uh, here is I'm talking about collective representation or macro representation. I'm talking about how well the, the government system as a whole represents the, the views and the priorities of the American public. Uh, traditionally, American political scientists talk about dyadic representation and the, the individual member of Congress, for example, and his or her constituents. And there are people who actually have calculated that today more Democrats are represented by Democratic members of Congress and more Republicans are represented by more Republican members of Congress than in the past, and so representation is better uh, in their view. Well, that to me is a, a rather pinched uh, notion of representation, of course, we can talk about that later. But I'm talking here about collective representation. It's, it's one of the articles that I pointed out. We're living in a very unusual period, a period of, of majority instability. Uh, control of our institutions has been up for grabs uh, for quite a few years now. Uh, we have a string here of four elections in which the patterns of control changed uh, in each election, and uh, from unified Republican uh, to divided government various forms. And had Romney won uh, the last election and with a split Congress, or had Obama uh, won, but the Democratic House Republican, the Republicans took the Senate, we would have had five consecutive changes. You have to go back to the 19th century to find anything like that. Uh, period 18, 19, 19, 19, 19, 1886 to 1894, we had five consecutive switches like this. This was the period of instability, historians refer to as the era of indecision. We had nothing like this in the whole 20th century. So it's, it's a really interesting pattern. And I've spent much of the last um, 10, 15 years <coughs> saying that it's not because of voters, that voters aren't fickle, voters aren't changing their minds all the time. Uh, this is the distribution of partisanship in the United States uh, since the Eisenhower era. The top uh, black line is the um, Democrats. You can see they lost uh, ground in the 50s, 60s, or maybe the 60s. 
They've been hanging around about 35 to 40 percent since. The bottom red line are the Republicans. Uh, they've never quite gotten back to where they were in the Eisenhower era. In the middle line that takes a big upswing in the late 60s are the independents uh, in this country. And as you can see, the last 30, 40 years, very little change. If we ask people what their ideology is, do they consider themselves liberals, conservatives, or moderates? Uh, the lines are even flatter. Uh, basically, uh, the prevailing pattern, the plurality pattern is moderate. That's the generally top line, around 40%. Uh, conservative is second. Uh, that's usually around 35% or so. And liberal always brings up the, the, the bottom with 25 to 30%. The term liberal is unpopular in American discourse. Uh, you find a lot of the conservatives and moderates will actually hold liberal policies on some issues, but no one likes, well not no one, but people don't like the liberal label. In much the same way that many women didn't like the feminist label, even while they have, they approved the various feminist policies. Uh, I've looked at a lot of individual issues, we get the same pattern, just simply not much has changed. <coughs> so when you're looking at change in American <coughs> politics, instability in American politics, the action is on the elite side. The action is what the parties and the candidates have been doing. <coughs> Now, one thing that everybody <coughs> talks about and bemoans is uh, polarization, polarization of the political class. These are uh, the uh, Paul Rosenthal scores that have been calculated, actually done back in the Continental Congress. You can see in the post-war period, the bottom line, the Democrats have been gradually moving away from the center toward the, the left. Republicans, uh, an interesting pattern, they actually got a little more centrist up to about the late 70s and then took a sharp swing to the right. Um, there, are, there are studies of county chairs, donors, et cetera, and the pattern is always the same widening polarization of the elites. John Aldrich has put together this figure from various sources. The bottom line are the positions of political activists, that is, people who work in campaigns and so forth. And there are differences on the liberal conservative scale, and they go from about one to about two and a half over this period, uh, that generation, so that more than doubled. The top line is donors. They go from about two and a half units apart to about four units apart. There were several recent papers at the American Political Science Association pointing out that more and more money in politics and congressional elections especially is coming from individual donations and individual donors <coughs> are really polarized. That more so than PACs, for example, more so than even, even party uh, committees. This has not gone unnoticed by the voters. Uh, voters increasingly see important differences between what the parties stand for. It was only <coughs> around 50% uh, up until the Reagan era where it jumps to about 60%. And then in, then in the Bush Obama era, it has jumped to near 80%. So voters are well aware of what's going on. Now, it's interesting that at the same time, uh, we've seen these polarizing trends at the elite level. Um, you've all seen these people bemoaning the fact that trust in government has plummeted uh, in the last two generations. That uh, they began asking the question in 1964, and as you can see, 75% of the people have trust in government most of the time, or just about always. And that simply plummets down to about 25% by 1980. A bit of a recovery during the Reagan era, then it drops again. A bit of a recovery during the Bush era, it drops again. We really have a, a somewhat distrusting, cynical electorate. Especially in Congress. Uh, Congress confidence in Congress is never uh, as high as in some other institutions like the presidency of the court. And as you can see, uh, it has gotten down to very poor levels in recent years. Uh, 10, 11 percent. George Will had a column in which he said, who are these 10 or 11 percent who still have <laughs> 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 in Congress? And, uh, and in fact, this is our most representative institution, the one that's supposed to be closest to the people. And yet, it brings up the bottom in Gallup. Uh, Gallup does these surveys every couple of years. How much confidence do you have? Congress is down around, they're below HMOs, they're below banks, they're below organized labor. That, that, uh, you know, that, that basically, it's, the, the country is very cynical and distrusting about its institutions. Now, the argument I make is that these trends are actually uh, uh, connected. That what happened was we <coughs> undertook a series of participatory reforms in this country in the 1960s and later. And they had the effect of bringing a lot of unrepresented participants into politics, uh, increasing their influence in politics. Now, when you add that to something called party sorting, which is the increasing homogenization of the two parties, which is something I didn't see for a long time, then you get uh, our current politics. So let's look at the two uh, pieces together here. Uh, just to go over some of these briefly, um, all the people in this room who are probably younger than probably 50 have never experienced anything other than the primary system, primaries and caucuses for, for picking presidential nominees. It used to be party bosses in smoke-filled rooms who chose nominees. And that went by the boards, um, not first at the presidential level and then increasingly through the system. We entered into an era of candidate-centered politics where parties, 
candidates built their own organizations. They didn't rely on traditional parties. Uh, the watchword at the time was government in the sunshine. So we opened up government um, meetings of committees and boards and everything were to be open. Votes were to be on the record. Uh, in the courts, uh, rules of standing were expanded. It became easier to get into the, into the courts and use the court system uh, for political meetings. Again, bureaucracy was to open up. Uh, notes and comments. Uh, we even subsidized interveners to sort of monitor and intervene in, in bureaucratic processes. At the local level, it was maximum feasible participation, trying to make, again, bring people into politics, so give us control over their lives. Nancy Burns, who did her thesis here with Sid, I believe, uh, did a great thesis on the uh, proliferation of local bodies, just, a, just all manner of local government organizations, which gave people further opportunities to participate. We had the advocacy explosion, which Jeff Berry wrote about, that when I took, grad, took interest group courses in undergraduate school, he talked about big business, big labor, and big government, or uh, big business labor and uh, agriculture, <coughs> and now it's just thousands and thousands of individual interest groups, many of them single purpose uh, interest groups. Propositions of various kinds, uh, the increasing use of that in the system, and new technologies, which, which you're all familiar with. So the idea was power to the people, but the problem was when the doors of government were open wide, it wasn't the people uh, who walked through them. It wasn't the ordinary people. Yeah, normal people, and I count myself among them, uh, or I'm not uninformed, but I am confused, I am ambivalent, I am pragmatic and not ideological, and most part, people are not extreme in their views. The vast bulk of Americans are like this. Yeah, I like to, to bring this just to the, to give people some sense of the numbers. This was a political interest by all measures was very high in the last campaign, that the uh, debates on uh, TV, TV broke records. The Ford and GOP debate uh, drew five million viewers. Everybody's very happy. Now bear in mind, there were 230 million eligible voters in the last election. So we're talking here a couple percent, four or five percent. My, uh, my colleagues at Stanford, uh, many of them in the political science department, uh, gnashed their teeth over Fox News. Uh, O'Reilly, which is the highest rated political show on cable television, gets about uh, two and a half, three percent of the, uh, of the possible voting uh, people every night. Uh, Fox News, about, uh, it's about one percent there. Uh, some of my Hoover colleagues think Rachel Maddow should be tried for treason. Uh, they shouldn't <laughs> worry about it. Four uh, <laughs> percent of the, uh, of the uh, people. And by comparison, American Idol last year drew 29 million people uh, a week in the Dance with the Stars and Cuba Girls. And I just found out something that I had no idea of, and I, I know the young people in this room know this, but apparently YouTube has TV channels, and I just was totally unaware of this. And one of the channels that's quite popular is called Epic Rap Battles of History, which is about rap music. And uh, they exceed O'Reilly uh, every time they pull one up. So, so the vast bulk of the population is not really tuned in reading the New York Times or just you know, Fox News or anything else. Uh, they're busy, uh, they're raising families, they're working for a living, they're trying to have some fun. You know, so I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a gulf between interest. Anybody who's really involved in politics is almost by definition unusual, unrepresentative. And when you look, I mean, people, uh, you know, a little over 10% say they've given money to a campaign over the years, hasn't really changed much. Uh, attended a meeting or rally, we're talking about under 10%. Uh, notice, even through Obama, uh, Obama mania in 2008, the lines don't move much. Worked for a party or a candidate, we're talking maybe 4 or 5% of the population <laughs> says they've done that. Why do people participate? Well, our, our former colleague uh, Jim Wilson uh, said there were three motives, three reasons people participated. One was material, they wanted to get something out of it, money, a job, etc. Two was solidary, uh, for social reasons, social ties, and social loyalties. The three was purposive, to save the wheels or to end nuclear war, uh, something like that. And the fact of the matter is we have really taken much of the material rewards out of politics for individuals. I mean, if you're an oil company, if you're a, a, a public employees union, there's still a lot of material benefits from politics, but for individual participation. The patronage system has been pretty much done in most places by civil service and public sector unionization. Uh, Ted Lowy once quipped that uh, the reason people used to go into politics was to have conflict of interest. And now, now we've made them made it illegal. Uh, the media treats, you know, the media's always in, on the lookout for scandal, uh, junkyard dogs and sabotos. Uh, uh, policies are universalistic. People are entitled to things. They don't get them at the whim or the decisions of uh, politicians or machines. And frankly, changes in the political culture. It's hard to imagine the, the population we have today accepting, finding acceptable the kind of politics we had through much of our history, the kind of patriotic-driven politics. 
Well, once you take away the material incentives, then what you have left are the solidarity incentives and the ideological the purpose of incentives. And Sid and, and other political scientists have spent a lot of time over the last few decades talking about uh, representation of minorities and women and class differences and so forth, and that's important. But the differences in some of these other areas are even more significant in terms of who, of, the bottom line is strong partisans. There are about 30% of the country considering itself a strong partisan in recent years. The top line is the number of people who donate money for the proportion. And see, we're up there about twice as many. Work for a party or candidate, the same thing. Strong partisans, around 30%, but they are the ones who are out there working. And of course, I mean, this is what, exactly what we expect. I mean, partisanship and ideologues, same thing. Uh, if you're extreme on the ideological scale, it's about 30%, but you donate money. Uh, you work. And yes, we expect the people who are most partisan, who are most ideologically extreme, to be the ones who participate. And some branches of political theory all through history have said, you know, we want people to be interested, we want people to be concerned and committed and so forth. But the problem is, all the studies we have show that if you're more extreme and you're more partisan, you are, you, you, you have views that are more extreme, that you're not really representative of the larger country. And it's not just the case that their, their views are extreme at their positions, and I want to emphasize this, their priorities, priorities also differ. This is a, a very nice question that the Pew poll uh, uh, asked last January. And you remember President Obama's inaugural address. He said, we're going to do three things. We're going to get on global, global warming. We're going to get on guns. We're going to get on immigration. These are our priorities. <laughs> now, this is the Pew question to ask people, what do you think should be the main priorities of Congress and the President in the coming year? And here we have economy, jobs, deficits, Social Security, education, Medicare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Immigration comes in at 17. Guns came in at 18. This is one month after Sandy Hook. Mm -hmm. taken. And global warming comes in at 28. Now, I'm not saying these issues aren't important. What I'm saying is these are not the primary concerns of the larger American public. These are the concerns of the political class, which get expressed in campaigns. And so we get this. <laughs> Republican tragic comedy uh, nomination race. It's being driven by small slices of highly unrepresentative people who dominate these kinds of processes. The night that um, Rick Santorum became the principal uh, contender to, to Mitt Romney's nomination by winning three contests, the Minnesota caucus, one in 100 registered voters in Minnesota turned out to those caucuses. The Colorado caucus, about two in every 100 registered voters in Colorado turned out to those caucuses. In Missouri, the beauty contest primary, seven out of every 100 registered voters in Missouri turned out. So small slices of highly unrepresented people are the political face of politics and have a disproportionate influence uh, in politics in this country. Now the second part of the story is party sorting. And this is something that took me a while to, to I mean I was fully aware of party sorting, but to, to represent, to get the connection. Had these people who are increasingly active in politics distributed themselves across both parties, the result would have been very different. Now think about the Democrats in race. For decades, the Democrats had both the most racially conservative and the most racially liberal representatives in their party. They just sort of split on racial issues and formed different coalitions. Environment. Earth Day was not a partisan uh, occasion. Uh, Muskie and Nixon sort of had a competition for who could sort of capture the environmental movement. Republicans had Theodore Roosevelt as a conservation president. The Audubon Society, Sierra Club, these are old line kind of affluent upper middle class things. Why, why didn't the environmental movement just split between the two parties? Abortion. The Democrats had both evangelicals and Catholics on the one hand, and they had liberals on the other. Why didn't they split? We could have had a situation in which the parties were badly factionalized, coalitions were constantly shifting. Why did we end up with what we did, what we have now? And that, the answer to that is party sorting. That, and this is a complicated story, which I tell, try to tell in the, in the Disconnect book, but basically demographic changes in the country opened up opportunities for new coalitions, that political entrepreneurs strategists saw opportunities to break up old coalitions and to form new ones. And just to take the, the most uh, obvious one, I think most people here would appreciate, if you look at the, the movement of African Americans to the north, which was just a tremendous internal migration, much of American history, African Americans, 90% of them are in the south. And it begins to change, especially after World War II. But as late as 1950, if you said African American, well, you did, the term wasn't used then, you'd have thought of somebody in bib overhaul standing in a cotton field in the south. By 1970, the, the mental image that comes to mind is somebody sitting on a tenement step in, in the north. That there's a massive transformation which makes the Northern Democratic Party more liberal, which then in turn 
pushes the Southern Democrats away and opens up the possibility for Republican gains in the South. At the same time, people are noticing that, gee, the population movements in this country are, are changing, that the South and the West are growing much faster than the Midwest and the East. And so it increases the attractiveness. There's correspondence between Richard Nixon and Martin Luther King in the late 50s where Nixon is exploring the possibility of getting African-American support. By 10 years later, Nixon is playing the Southern strategy. He's looking at the handwriting on the wall, so to speak, and saying that's the direction uh, we're going in. And I, I talk about a number of these, but I think in general that's the story, that, that, that entrepreneurs, strategists in the party see opportunities to bring these groups into their parties, and the result is this party sorting. So I've come back to the instability uh, we have now. It arises from the fact, I think, that now it's more than ever, the parties overreach once they get in office. That because they're so distinct and their bases are so distinct, and probably they themselves, the candidates, are ideologically more distinct than in the past, the attempt is to try to do what you can as soon as you get into office. Even if it's not, when you think about, you know, the simple idea is Democrats build their coalitions from the left, Republicans build them from the right, and you've got to get enough of the center to win. Overreach simply means you govern in a way that loses the center. You lose the marginal members of your coalition. And I think both parties have been doing that, which is why we're getting the ping-ponging. So Richard Nixon, uh, no, excuse me, uh, George Bush, has a fairly narrow re-election victory in 2004. And then he says, I earned capital in the campaign, and now I intend to spend it. And he announces a freedom agenda. He announces a plan to uh, bring private, uh, Social Security private accounts. And a whole lot of voters think, I never remember voting for any of that. <laughs> now, it turns out, in his memoirs, uh, Bush says, well, on second thought, maybe I, I misread the electoral mandate there. There wasn't a mandate. The American electorate rarely gives mandates. <coughs> Same thing, uh, you remember Obama's, uh, when he claimed the nomination and talked about uh, the rise of the oceans, heal the planet. If I'm Obama's advisor, I say, let's put a period instead of that semicolon and strike out all that stuff afterwards. Yeah. Let's, let's proceed more cautiously, let's proceed more incrementally. Obama was elected, people weren't sure what they'd done. This is, do you think he's a liberal, a moderate, or a conservative? Uh, that bottom line is conservative. Uh, almost 10% of the people thought they'd elect a conservative. Uh, maybe this is Cambridge, Brookline, San Francisco <laughs> voters, <laughs> I don't know, but I mean, uh, they did. But everybody else is split. They're not sure, is he a moderate, is he a liberal? Well, as you can see, nine months later, they're, they're clear, okay, we elected a liberal. And the buyer's remorse begins to set in. And he loses independence uh, within the first year. Starts out with 60% approval on independence and a lot of people holding their views. And by December, uh, he's uh, you know, crossing over. And people sometimes um, discount the role of independence in campaigns. They say, well, there really aren't that many. They don't turn out as much. But they are a tremendous source of volatility and what happens in campaigns. And you look back, 1980, the Reagan Revolution, the independents swung 10% in a pro-Republican direction uh, that year. Um, 1984, then they come back to the Democrats uh, in the early Clinton years. 1994, there's a very uh, severe reaction uh, against the Democrats there. Uh, Bush, you see there. The last two election, two midterms, that's a 17-point swing against the Republicans in 2006, an 18-point swing against the Democrats in 2010. So they're ping-ponging back and forth as we get parties basically trying to do more than the center is really uh, asking for. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> I suppose there might be questions. Yes. I have one very general question. Uh, by uh, what you, you thanked us, which is very nice, but you then say it's the end. And I sort of look at American politics today and what's happening over the next few weeks, and it's a very general question. Is it the end of what we would like to see uh, in politics, which is moderate representation with some on some side, some on the other side? What do you I, mean, I, I was talking to Alan about this beforehand, and there are all kinds of people now trying to Oh, all kinds of people trying to, what can we do to make it better? Like Larry Kramer with the Hewlett Foundation has a new project on the democratic dysfunction. And, you know, people talk about redistricting reform and they talk about campaign finance reform. And I don't think the answer lies in any institutional tinkering. I think we're, if you look back to that 19th century period, which is a really interesting period in American politics, it went on like this for 20 years. 
It wasn't until a, a national Republican majority emerged in 1896 that put an end to it. And I think we may be just facing something like that. It's not until a new governing majority forms and articulates a new governing philosophy that people really, uh, you know, as long as we keep ping-ponging back and forth, divide government, we're not going to make any progress on the kinds of, of politics, uh, kinds of policies we need. And, and by the way, um, I recommend a, a new book and a new project by Francis Lee who talks about just how the fact that every institution is up for capture every election, how that changes everything into purely a skins and shirts game, basically. It's, it, we win, they lose. That's every, every decision you can make in government becomes simply a matter of making sure you win and they lose. And until somebody comes up, you know, I mean, and, and who, who can tell the shape of what that new governing majority is going to be? But to me, the answer is electoral. It's not tinkering with institutions. So you put your faith in uh, one side or the other winning. Yes. Not, in, not yes. in compromise. No, I think that's right. Winning in a way that people, people look at what they do and say, yeah, that's good. And so you have a clear majority to do what you did, like, like the New Deal. No. I mean, it's basically, if you look at some of the episodes in American history where, you know, it's, the realignment literature, I think, is interesting, not so much in the voting part of it, but after each of these major realignments, we had 14 years of unified government. That and people really implemented their uh, their platform, and it was approved and ratified by the population. And so I think uh, until we get that, I mean, it, as, as long as we ping pong, uh, I, I think people, as I said, they're they're not giving the public what it wants. And until they do, I think we get. But uh, does the public want compromise, or the, does the, it the want a wants, win? A win the, by the one The public side. wants success. I mean, the public wants. Mm -hmm. They don't want. Endless wars. Uh, they don't want a bad economy. Uh, they don't want fighting over, um, well, needless fighting. You know, and they, they, I think co compromise to the extent that it results in better government. I think they want it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Perhaps. Uh, the, the prior period that you cite, um, you know, for this this period, you attributed to the the opening up, the participation, and so forth. What was the reasoning for the uh, for the great? Uh, disruption in the prior in the prior mm -hmm. period and are there any similarities <clears throat> great point uh, I don't know I mean this is a period of very strong parties as you know party organizations uh, actually Mickey why don't you answer that question <laughs> uh, I was going to ask it though <laughs> <laughs> uh, well it, it does I'll answer it by asking it um, or ask it by answering it. Uh, I'm uh, intensely aware of the validity of your, in uh, broader sense, statistical point, quantitative point. But I, underneath, there are institutional and cultural differences that really force, I think, a recasting of the question. Uh, the relative uh, 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 balance of the late 19th century had a lot, uh, had uh, an enormous amount to do with the character of the party system. Its infusion into the most basic levels of, uh, of uh, the society. Uh, its ability to bring out enormous, as you know, enormous percentages of the electorate to vote. And this was done through an elaborate party system. The Pennsylvania Republican Party had a card catalog of six to eight hundred thousand names around 1900 of individual voters, and on each card was written, "Tends to fumble in the booth, can be relied on," that sort of thing. Uh, in Indiana, the breaking down of the electorate of a quarter of a million people into groups of five. I mean, there was enormous organizational infrastructure. Now, that's all gone today. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that you can reconstitute a previous historical pattern in a world that is so different. Uh, I share completely your desire for a, a new birth of moderation. But given the character of American politics today, the culture of American politics today, it's hard to see any significant change within a reasonable time period uh, in the uh, in the factors that are uh, uh, determining our current polarization. What happened in the 1890s that changed that system and led to a semi you know a, a long-standing Republican majority? Uh, I, uh, the same sort of thing on a that happened in 1964 with Goldwater and 1972 with McGovern. 
a disastrous choice of a candidate. Mm -hmm. I think Brian mm -hmm. is the centerpiece in what happened in the, uh, mm -hmm. in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. Because the issues of the time, the depression of the early mm -hmm. 90s and so on, uh, either party had the potential to deal with it. But by putting all their chips in somebody who was anti-industrial at a time when American life was moving at the rate of an express train into industrialization was not the wisest political decision in our history. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but do you agree with that, Mo? Uh, because uh, well, that, that, doesn't that seem to put everything yeah, place? I guess uh, the, put, put uh, the importance on uh, on the quality of, the, of individuals. Oh well, I, I think know, it's pro in individual candidates, whether they were and whether they are are good, and uh, also whether they succeed. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, Brian, of course, was not just a, a lone figure. He represented a, a strong thrust in American politics at the time, um, in in much the same way that many of these we have these <coughs> smaller, intense thrusts today. I guess the the question I'd ask in return is. But you could have imagined the Republicans winning and swinging completely to the other side and being rejected again. You know, the fact of the matter is they consolidated their majority somehow. They, they governed in a way from that point forward that they kept winning elections right up to the 1930s, except for Wilson. Uh, yeah, because they yeah. were more in tune with the uh, rise of the growth of an urban industrial society. Yeah. Uh, and it took the Great Depression and the New Deal to, uh, to change that. Mm -hmm. But my point would be that it might take something equivalent to change the current uh, uh, alignment. Mm -hmm. I don't, uh, you know, I, uh, it, it seems to me that Brian was the product of a, almost 100 years or 70 years of the democratic dilemma of a rising urban Irish heavily Irish electorate, over 90% of the Irish Americans voted Democratic in the 19th century, uh, and uh, that big southern base. And uh, I think you could make the argument that they, they could have decided differently, and ultimately, I guess, with Wilson and then with Roosevelt, they do. Mm -hmm. But it takes a generation yeah. for them. Oh, I agree with that, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I, I, it seems to me more that <coughs> we have not had people coming in like, like McKinley who grasped the situation. That uh, Bush first, I think, fumbled away an opportunity to build a real majority, and then I think Obama fumbled away an opportunity. If we'd have had a different, I mean. Well, I mean, you yeah. can say that of the late 19th century presidents, which yes. helps explain the yeah. phenomenon you No, no I think that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Alan Wolf. Um, I want to get back to the president. I, I agree completely that the only solution is a electoral. I can't see any tinkering with campaign finance or redistricting getting us out of this. But I don't agree that it's someone will establish a winning coalition. I think it's someone has to establish a losing coalition. I, I've just noticed in the last few days, as everyone sees the apocalypse coming in a week or two, that some of those moderate centrist political commentators are saying, you know, the only thing we can do now is go off the cliff. That's the only way to purge what you know people call the, the poison or you know whatever your partisan mm -hmm. side. And I'm sort of coming around to that position. I mean, I can't believe that I find myself thinking this, but you know I don't see any other solution other than one party becoming completely discredited. Mm -hmm. That could be either party, but of course, mm -hmm. you know which one I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, no, I mean tied back to Mickey's point. Then, yeah, I think that's right. That's how it starts. Mm -hmm. But then the other party has to avoid going off the deep end on the other side. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't say, okay, the world has changed. We, no matter what we do, mm -hmm. we're the majority now. I think you have to sort of take advantage of your situation yeah. in an intelligent way. Um, let me just add that uh, thinking of the shift with the New Deal and after, a large part of the relative success of the shift from the 1930s to the 1970s was the degree to which the Republicans adapted to the new conditions of American mm -hmm. politics and government. Mm -hmm. Because by 19th, you could argue, even by 36, but certainly by 1940, with Wilkie and then Dewey uh, and Eisenhower, they've come a long way from the obdurate anti-New yep. Dealism of the early mid-30s. Mm -hmm. Right, sir, what have you got under that straw hat of yours? Uh, yes. Um, 
a mind, hopefully, that uh, mm -hmm. will contribute something helpful, useful. Um, you <coughs> talked about the ping-ponging, and the ping-ponging seems to me to be an artifact of duopoly. So I wonder, first of all, if you'd speak to that a little bit. And it sounds like you say, well, forget about changing the, the structure of the system. But then you talk about independent voters. Maybe people, even in democratic Massachusetts, 50% of the voters are registered unenrolled. Right. Those independent voters, people have thought about trying to mobilize and organize and possibly generate alternative political parties, not just mm -hmm. one, maybe more than one. Ralph Nader is an example of somebody who tried to do that with the Green Party, even though he remained registered as an independent. <coughs> so um, is there not an opportunity for something to happen that might speak to that disillusionment, that disenchantment, that might be grounded in the disaffection of, of, of <coughs> maybe especially independent voters, but also Democrats and Republicans? And what is it that those voters really want? I mean, is, you say moderation, but can you maybe be a little more specific? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've obviously yeah, it's no, not sure. just one thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> well, there are about three questions wrapped up yeah, there, so let me just yeah. try to keep track of them. Um, yeah, I remember uh, David Brooks in a column some years ago said, somewhere out there, there is a younger, saner Ross Perot. And <laughs> I, I mean, I think regular, there is a market for, for an independent candidacy. And so far, we haven't had a Perot type who just seemed to fit at the time. That people have voted that idea that. Boomer, Huntsman, et cetera, et cetera. I think there is a market. I mean, and, and I, the market would be, somebody would be more likely to enter if the nominees were really unacceptable. Um, and so, um, depends on who the Republic, let's say that, let's say the Obama administration is a miserable failure, and so, so all the Democrats are tarnished and Republicans go off the deep end and nominate some totally unelectable character, then maybe there's, that's the opportunity. Uh, the question about what do people want, I think, you know, it's a mistake to think of independence as being a single group of moderate or centrist voters. There are all kinds of independents. There are those kinds. There are people who are cross-pressured who, libertarians, who would say, well, I like the Republicans on economic issues, but not on social issues. There are people who just don't care. <laughs> there are people who hate all, you know, it's just there's, there's all kinds of, but they're all particularly mobilizable against the, 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 the duopoly, as you say. Um, but, and then what, what would please people? Just simply success. Just simply, you know, the idea that there's been progress. That I think the sense is that we've been just, well, if you go back to Clinton, I mean, who, I think Clinton frittered away an opportunity by his personal feelings. I think Bush frittered away an opportunity by the way he reacted to uh, terrorism. I think Obama frittered away by just delegating everything to Rahm Emanuel and Nancy Pelosi. Um, you know, I think, I think we've had, God, how many years now of just opportunities foregone? Yeah, we've missed one after another. And so I think people just want to see some progress, the notion that we are moving forward and not, not actually slipping backwards, which yeah, a lot of people feel like. Use, uh, uh, hopeless for people to think about maybe developing alternative party formations and opening up the system to actually allow for that. I think the, the possibility of doing that institutionally is so difficult. I think it, it basically has to come from a Perot type. It has to come from an independent person, leader outside. Now, there, are, there is an infrastructure. There are all kinds of groups out there that are sort of like centrist groups, moderate groups, et cetera, that, that uh, little groups, often state and local level. So there is an infrastructure. And also, it is so much easier with the internet now compared to when Perot had to do this before the internet technology. So it's there, and it's cheaper, too. So um, it, it depends on if things get bad enough, and if the candidates are unacceptable enough, then I think you can see this kind of thing again. And then, I mean, you know, you all remember, um, well, no, you don't, some of you are too young. <laughs> I can't, uh, can't say that. Um, basically, Gingrich looked at Perot's voters and said, we gotta get those. And the whole contract is written, okay, what do these people want? And let's, let's sort of write the contract to get these moving in that direction. And so when you get a person like that comes in, then the party's it's that big a shock, the parties have every incentive to, to sort of figure out what that person was, what Senate was drawing on. Yeah. Peter Scarry. Yes, um, it seems to me there's a kind of um, unresolved, um, I don't know, schizophrenia or something in, in your analysis. Mm -hmm. it, it, you, your, your focus and your talk and, and a lot of what you've written over the last 10 years is on what's going on with elites. Okay, and, and that that's mm -hmm. makes sense to me. But then when you start talking about the changes in the incentives 
uh, that are available to, to um, mobilize um, voters uh, or party adherents. Um, you, you know, you use Jim Wilson's uh, uh, framework, but don't pay any attention to the implications of it, which is that propulsive or solidary incentives are much more difficult to wield. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, much of what you describe, um, you, you know, was, uh, sort of fits sort of what, what, what you know, mass society theorists used to talk about long before it ever happened. Mm -hmm. that, that we have m m many more, uh, certainly not all, but many more uh, um, independent political actors and voters um, who are very volatile. Um, and that's certainly what the independent story is all about, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. um, so that leaves me wondering, well, what then structurally, um, and I understand that's not the direction you want to go in, but if you buy any of what I've just said, it sort of it seems to me it leads you to some sort of structural considerations. What's going to bring that back together? If, if we live in a world of propulsive and solidary incentives that are so hard to wield, and we've got so many relatively independent, individ, more massified, uh, a more massified electorate, what is going to pull this back together? I mean, talking about different mm -hmm. kinds of candidates, different kinds of agendas, don't get at that. Yeah, that's very depressing. Camera, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Peter. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Hmm. Want to borrow my hat? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> that's a no. So even if you ha even once you have the the cataclysm and the Perot type figure totally upsets the system. What's to establish, what's to prevent a com just a reestablishment of the new system? Same thing, ordinary people go back doing their ordinary lives and whichever new set of interest groups is out there just sort of, uh, yeah. Well, if you're right, we're doomed. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, yeah. Jim Hankins. Yeah. How about hatred of government? Is it possible? <laughs> Uniting the court, yeah. especially uh -huh. since the oh, government, yeah. even though the absolute number of people in the government, the federal government is going down, mm -hmm. uh, the powers of government are getting very, very scary. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of people. Uh, and um, especially the surveillance, I think, has got a lot of people worried. And, and, it's, and the, the reach of government, the scope of government, the sort of ambitions of people in power to control individual lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there have been a lot of people talking about a libertarian moment now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder if what might set, I agree with you, it's very hard to upset the party system, but what, something that really might set off a, a unification of the American people is the same thing that set them off in the 18th century, which is you know, hatred of powerful central governments telling people what to do. Mm -hmm. I, think that, I think that a politician could take advantage of that. <coughs> Um, I'm not sure how much formal it is, but, but I'll be interested to know what you think about the, the, the possibility of the libertarian moment there. Mm -hmm. And about, about libertarian uh, populists in particular. Yeah, yeah. So I think that, that's, a, that's a different, it seems to me that's a different way of slicing the electorate. It, it is, and you're seeing signs of it. I mean, if you look at the, the joint joining of sort of left-wing Democrats with libertarian Republicans on things like the security, the spying, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, is it possible that a sort of a, not necessarily Rand Paul, but that kind of figure can sort of split, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, the Republicans keep missing opportunities to go war. It's one of them, yeah. Um, and just sort of the, the public employees unions, crony capitalism, you know, interfering government, I think you could put together that's sort of my dream list of putting together uh, yeah. a platform. I was struck by um, your, your statistics mm -hmm. showing that, that small business that has huge support and big business that has very little support. Mm -hmm. That seems to be an electoral opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. That's positive.
Can you talk a little bit more about why you think um, fiddling with a mechanic such as uh, the primary system, or, the, or, or rather it's the partisan gerrymandering system. If you could have states, more states somehow deciding we want to have uh, a system of drawing district lines that are not partisan gerrymander, why, I mean, putting aside the question of how politically likely that is, don't you think it would make that, wouldn't, wouldn't that make a considerable difference? No. Um, there's, a, there's a big literature on redistricting, including by Steve Ansel over here, here who shows that uh, competitive, people from competitive districts are basically just as polarized as people from safe districts. Mm -hmm. And the reason would appear to be primaries, that in a, in a competitive district you still have to win your nomination. And so then you say, well, let's go to the primary system. And we've done that in California. First we had the blanket primary, which the Supreme Court in a bad decision I think threw out, and now we have this top two primary. And other states have this too, but the pro problem is people still don't turn out. Even if independents are allowed to vote in the primaries, again, you saw some of those figures up there. The average turnout in congressional primaries in this country year in and year out is always in single digits. That less than 10% of the eligible voters in any congressional primary actually turn out. And so it's still the case that the people who are ideologically and partisan motivated are going to be the ones who dominate the process, no matter what you do with the institutions. So, yes. So I'm wondering how, if there is this sort of general popular thirst for moderate candidates, voters don't elect more moderate candidates. I mean, putting primaries aside, moderates do get nominated and elected, and a lot of times then they lose. If you look the last few elections, in 06 and 08, it was the moderate Republicans disproportionately who lost, and then in 2010, it was the blue dogs who got wiped out, many of whom voted against the Affordable Care Act, voted against the stimulus package, and they still you know, lost. And then here in <coughs> other states in 2012, we had a moderate senator here in this state who lost to a very non-moderate mm -hmm. challenger. So you know, how does this fit into the sort of voter demand for moderation? Well, it's, it's not a demand for, uh, moderation means one thing to a Democrat, means something else to a strong Republican. Uh, and like you, you have basically, clearly parties have edges around the country, and so what is, the, you know, yeah, I mean, Scott Brown, and as opposed to Elizabeth Warren, I think Elizabeth Warren probably did fit the Massachusetts mold pretty well. But it's, it's the other part, though, is the, is the, like the blue dogs, the ones who voted against the health care bill, half of them survived. Anybody who voted for the health care bill or the cap and trade bill went down. So basically, the, it, it, we're in an era where the parties are sufficiently homogeneous that you're tarnished with your party's image even if you are a moderate. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to go to great lengths, like the governor of West Virginia is shooting, <laughs> shooting a rifle at the health care bill to sort of reestablish some sort of you know, independent uh, uh, image. And um, so, I mean, I, I th and again, it's not just the voters are demanding moderation. Voters are demanding something get done. I don't think voters care that much about what policies are actually chosen. They care about results. And so, I mean, it, it, I think they're worried about Obamacare, you know, basically, is this going to work or is it just going to be less choice and more, more expense? I think, I think basically they don't have any principled opposition to it, voters as a whole, as opposed to Republican primary people. Here's this fellow over here who's been trying to get in. I don't think you can see him over the, no, you, right there, yeah, yeah. Um, I was wondering, left out of the narrative that you gave us was uh, the role that the rise of uh, ideological movements in, in, in the 20th century might have played in driving people further apart, um, elites particularly, because where are these guys getting their ideas from? If, you know, it's not as if people just sprung up and just spontaneously all coalesced around a certain set of uh, political beliefs. I mean, you definitely have the conservative movement. I haven't said the new left as much, but um, did those kinds of ideological movements play a, a significant role beyond institutional factors that sort of uh, polarize the, the political elites? Mickey. <laughs> <laughs> Here's our expert on the 19th century, so I mean, just why not take advantage of him? Harvey hasn't even paid me. He's <laughs> 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 got lunch. <laughs> uh, also, the time to bring evangelicals into the Republican fold. Yeah. He's talking about... Well, you know, if you look at the Tea Party and uh, Occupy Wall Street, 
uh, which is one of those you know, chronological <coughs> equivalences, whatever the difference. It does tell you something about the pressures uh, for the uh, pure ideological expression of a political point of view. And uh, they obviously had a lot in common, a lot of overlap, which reinforces your point mm -hmm. about the underpinning of a kind of general concern about large institutions mm -hmm. and uh, privilege and mm -hmm. so on that crops up really uh, in both electorates. Uh, I found it interesting that both of them uh, rooted themselves fairly strongly in the past. Mm -hmm. You'll be astonished to hear that an historian came to that conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Tea Party, uh, the, the name itself suggests how rooted it is in a whole uh, mythology of the revolution and Jeffersonianism and so on, all the way through. Uh, the Declaration, the Constitution. Uh, Occupy Wall Street, uh, their references were started with uh, the Commune, the Paris Commune, mm -hmm. which was important in, in, in some of their rhetoric. Uh, went on, of course, to the Civil Rights Movement, to the uh, uh, demonstrations uh, in 1968. A lot of them were stunned to hear that the demonstrations in Chicago were directed at the Democratic Convention and not the Republican <laughs> Convention. That was not widely understood. <laughs> but there's obviously a need yeah. for, to, to root mm -hmm. these movements in, uh, in, in an, an imagined or real past. Uh, so in that sense, there's a, a, a source that's feeding ideology, an historical source. Uh, but you know, I think both the uh, experience of Occupy Wall Street and of the uh, Tea Party suggests how uh, shallowly rooted this is, how difficult it is to create uh, a movement that has both a solid ideological base and broad popular appeal. And that reverts back, I think, finally, to the nature of contemporary culture, which is fed by uh, forces, technology, values, uh, institutions that have uh, as a common denominator rootlessness, uh, quick adaptation, rapid change. And it's hard to imagine the kind of political stability that you've been talking about in a culture such as that. Mm -hmm. uh, Rory. So you agree with me? I wanted to ask about the moderates and the blue line. I mean, it's so when it's plotted with the extreme and increasing uh, conservative and liberal identification, the moderates staying the same, are, is it really mean the same thing over time to be a moderate? I, they come out as your heroes and they're normal people and they want success. That's how you broadly define it. Could it be part of the problem is that we don't have to have any indignation towards them, but that they want their, they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. So. Those normal examples would be that when you have high economic growth, you can have high spending and low taxes, which moderate normal people would be in favor of. And as growth slows down, you're in tougher times, then you have to make a choice. So it's, it becomes much harder to be a moderate, or it's unclear what moderation would mean anymore. Um, and another, I guess, issue would be entitlements. You know, it seems like entitlements, Medicare and Social Security especially, they're not simply government programs. They enter the realm of some kind of moral expectation of government, some kind of duty of the government, a contract with the citizens, and that makes them kind of beyond or above politics. Um, or at least that's something that the parties who are in favor of protecting them do. Does that make it, a, again, a problem for these moderates who may simply be asking for incoherent things? Um, they wanting to vote uh, more towards a libertarian or more conservative fiscal policy of Romney, but absolutely opposed to any change in Medicare, so think of Florida. And so the, the moderate so-called the center, through, through these changes, through the, the rise in the debt, they're, I mean, is this part of the crisis that you have a huge number of people who are demanding incommensurable things, who are not um, willing to entertain truly drastic uh, reform of entitlements mm -hmm. who are therefore making it politically poisonous or creating third rails of politics to mention what might be necessary economic reforms. Mm -hmm. The parties don't want to do that. I just, I wonder if, if, if that could be part of the problem mm -hmm. then. I wonder what your thoughts are. Mm -hmm. 
funny thing is, there have been exhaustive analyses of liberals and conservatives, but to my knowledge, no one has ever looked at the moderates and said, what exactly do they believe? I suspect they'd be all over the map, just like we talked about independence. Um, my sense in looking at public opinion data is that the population is, in, including the moderates, but the population as a whole is a lot more willing to consider some of these incommensurables than politicians give them credit for. They sort of know Social Security and Medicare need some sort of changes to make them sustainable in the long run. But there's just, the, 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 immediately when one party makes some proposal, the other one absolutely attacks them. And I think, I think just like Perot when he came onto the, came on the scene and just said, look, we got these budget deficits, and neither party is willing to talk about them. The Democrats just say, we'll continue, keep borrowing, and Republicans say, we'll just keep you know, spending, uh, we'll, we'll just keep cutting taxes. Um, I think the same thing is true for, for if a politician, a, a modern day pro came and said, look, we have to do something sensible about Medicare and Social Security. And here's some modest proposals, because basically it doesn't take a lot to really make a difference in these programs. Um, I think people would be willing to listen, but it's just uh, we haven't gotten there yet. Sorry. I was basically going to ask the same question. You said the voters want success, but from a conservative's point of view, Medicare and Social Security from their inception uh, could never be a success and certainly don't appear to be a success mm -hmm. now, yet they were popular then and they appear to be popular now. So essentially, my question was the same as this gentleman's, I think. They're not a success. They're not a success. <laughs> well, I mean, they're well, going broke. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, Social Security, that's one of the discouraging things. Social Security is trivial. You talk to any of the policy people in Washington, they just see some modest uh, thing about indexing and uh, maybe minor tax increases and delaying the retirement age a little bit, like a lot of the European countries have already done. And that's, you can forget about it for the next 75 years. It's okay. Medicare is tougher, especially with the demographic shift that's about to occur as we head off into the nursing homes and so forth. And, uh, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, but that's tougher. But still, I mean, I think people understand it, and I, I think they're solvable problems. They're not, they don't require a revolution in public policy to solve, but nobody's willing to tackle them even to that extent. Um, uh, Steve Urban, and then Mark Landry. I think part of the discussion that may be missing in terms of where the government goes is we're talking in very general terms about moderates, about libertarians, about conservatives, and you looked at the list of what people thought was the most important problems was the economy and things of that sort. Way down at the bottom of the list, the second column, was gun control. And then you wonder, if that's so far down, how come the NRA is considered one of the most powerful forces in American politics? And I've often seen that the N there are two organizations that are always listed as two of the most powerful lobbies in Washington. One is the NRA and the other is APAC, both of which deal with very specific issues right. that isn't at the top of the public's mind, but is at the top of the minds of a limited number of people who are the kinds of people who not only would vote uh, for that and nothing else, but would put money into that and nothing else. And so the question one asks is, is there a way of <clears throat> curbing what in American society very often is the great power of focused uh, interests? Uh, and that's you know, man manifested in the way in which uh, lobbies of a variety of sorts work. So let me come back to my question of the end. Uh, I wake up in the morning, I read the newspapers, and I am um, think of myself as one always will be a knee-jerk liberal. I can't change that. Uh, I am, I tell people, an optimist because I think the future is uncertain. Uh, <laughs> and then I read the paper and I hear all this conversation and I realize all this fussing around with the government isn't going to get us anywhere because uh, sooner or later we're all going to drown. And, then, <laughs> and that's not done by anybody in particular. It's done by everybody in unison, or maybe it's done by forces well beyond us. Uh, and, I, and, and I wonder about you know, the notion of there's a need for libertarianism, because we want individuals to be able to have more voice. But if there's any truth to the fact that global warming is really going on, uh, that requires strong government across governments. 
Uh, that, that last one was a ramble <laughs> <laughs> to express my knee-jerk liberalism. <laughs> but anyway, I think that the idea of there being so many possibilities under the structure of our government for specific focused interests to have much more voice than one would expect given their numbers, uh, even given their resources. It's how they would focus their resources. And how does that fit into what, where we're going? Well, negatively. That is, in fact, a big part of the problem, that we have lots and lots of groups like that. You just named two of the best known. But all through the system, there are groups like that. And it's, as they say, at the local level, too, I see this. Mm -hmm. California is just ground zero for little groups doing things to you. You wake up in the morning, you read the paper, and you can't do this anymore. You know, and it's just, and, and so, I mean, I, yeah, I think, um, the system is is that way. It just it rewards people who participate. It rewards the 25 people who show up at these local board meetings and when some proposal is on on the agenda. Uh, and and meanwhile, people keep sort of waking up and finding out that the government is not addressing the big things. So that Palo Alto has just established a new foreign policy, for example. You know, it's just not that Palo Alto is getting the trash picked up better. You know, it's it's that sort of. Uh, well, now we have 350 yeah. dollar work though, and maybe that will stop the. Inundation. <laughs> Mark. Hi. Uh, so, wonderful information about this, the stability of attitudes and then this dreadful information about the drop in trust the legitimate and terrible news about low uh, participation rates. Um, I want to just ask this if I could just a question. It might have some uh, uh, reflection. It might might reflect on the problem. What what do the numbers look like on just basic civic education, the, the voter knowledge about uh, the, the three branches of government, checks and balances, the theory of limited governments, limited powers. A lot of very powerful ideas that I think on the whole press in a moderate direction. I'm just wondering if people, I'm guessing that maybe people know a lot less about these things, and so they're not thinking about them. They're thinking about, you know, the guns. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Sid has something more recent. The last thing I really read on that was Deli Carpini's book about just information levels in general, about both policy and institutions, et cetera. And the conclusion was people are certainly no better informed now than they were a generation ago. And Marty Wattenberg has some stuff on that too, where not only here, but internationally, that people know less. Uh, I mean, th there's more information available than ever before, and people actually know less. They're, they're not digesting it. Wattenberg and Bill Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just one quick question. We're supposed to be a religious country, but people's religious ignorance, <laughs> which is in which book of the Bible, all those things, is just astonishing. Yeah. It's worse. It's worse than uh, people don't even know what their own denominations are. Yeah, yeah. Luth Lutherans don't know what Luther about Luther and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess going back to the the definition of what a moderate is, which, which I think is really elusive, you know, elusive. And I just have a, a couple of anecdotes which I think might uh, uh, bear on it. Um, you know, you'll hear ads on the on the radio with respect to uh, nursing homes, with respect to planners who can can help you with respect to nursing homes, which basically is various types of techniques to move assets of the, uh, of, the, of the persons going into the nursing home to their family members so that the government is uh, you know, paying for it. These are, are ordinary people and, uh, you know, it, are they moderates? They're trying to, to get a fairly significant benefit from the, uh, from the government. They're going through various gyrations on it. Another that comes to mind is, uh, yeah, I've had a great difficulty really figuring out who the Tea Party are. And occasionally you will see being quoted a retired policeman or retired fireman who of course are the beneficiaries of extremely generous mm -hmm. government plants and yet they're they're members of the uh, of the Tea Party, mm -hmm. so I'm not quite certain where that where that ends up. Other than you come down to well, people are just going to grab what they can, which is you know for their own uh, benefit. But how does it really 
tie in ideologically as to who are moderates or even what, who Tea Party, who tea party uh, members are. Mm. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, there are people have pointed out the contradictions in Tea Party uh, membership and so forth. Um, I, I sort of agree with you in part. Americans want to get what they get and don't worry too much about the ideological coherence of what they're, what they're wanting. I mean, I think that comes down to a lot of it. Um, I mean, they are, they are not moderates. I mean, it's, um, I guess I'm, I'm a little unclear on your question. What comes out? Well, it's also, if I may, mm -hmm. um, it's not that people are trying to get something from the government, I think, just the way you ex explained mm -hmm. it, but people trying to avoid having something they feel is theirs yeah, being unfairly taken yeah. away yeah. beyond what would be reasonable. I think so. Yeah. I don't know if that changes how to understand the okay. question. But oh, I okay, no, I, I, okay, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's that strong strain that people have written on this of saying, I earned this. You know, that I have it coming. The government is obligated. That's not the same thing as somebody on food stamps, as somebody getting supplementary income, et cetera, or disability, et cetera, that, that I paid into this or I put in my 25 years and I earned this. Yeah, that people have written that. To, we, we are, I guess, probably pretty good at saying, making that distinction between what we get and what other people get. But, but the nursing home example is closer to the food stamp, really, yeah. when it yeah. comes down to it. Mm -hmm. uh, except that it's much more money that's, that's involved <laughs> right. than for a typical uh -huh. food stamp yeah. recipient. Mm -hmm. But that wouldn't be the, I wonder what the Tea Party types would think of that if you just asked them. Well, I yeah. have another anecdote of a friend of mine, uh, brother is, is about as right wing as they, they come. And when his father got to where he needed nursing home and so forth, he found every single government program that, that, that there was to, to cover the cost 100% for the, for the nursing home. So, and I'm sure partly, partly he justified it by saying there are a whole lot of other people getting all kind of stuff that I'm paying for, and therefore I'm perfectly morally justified in doing whatever I can to get government benefits. The mortgage interest deduction is another example, mm -hmm. which is contentious mm -hmm. around those same considerations. Andy over here has a question. I wanted to follow up on Rory's question about moderates trying to have their cake and eating it too and ask about the topic of crises and praise and blame. So with the example of an economic crisis, which party pays the political cost of it? With the example of today where we have an enormous amount of debt but actually low interest rates and what the effect of a financial crisis down the road, how that might play out in terms of how it would affect both parties. Well, I mean, a, b a big enough crisis, um, when it hits, will affect the party in power. I mean, Bush, you know, pe people, even, even a year or two later, people were still blaming Bush. Actually, even four years later, people were still blaming Bush. So whoever is in office, if we have this rampant inflation or something like that, uh, is going to suffer. And the question is whether it will lead to a, um, a, a, a Roosevelt-type majority or whether it just simply shifts back to the other party in four or eight years. I think it depends what we're talking about, the, whoever comes in who takes advantage of the situation in a credible way. Uh, it's not enough just, it's, it's enough to be not the other guy to win. But to get reelected and to have your party continue to win, you have, can't be just not the other guy. At some point, you have to start saying, we have a plan. It's, things are getting better. I mean, if you look at Reagan, I mean, he comes in, and, and basically the first two years are pretty crappy. And he take a beating in the congressional elections. And then things are really moving along by the fourth year, and he gets really elected. And things keep moving. And so people decide for at least a while there that, well, the Republicans have the right answer uh, to this. And they keep, even through Bush, uh, and arguably, who knows what would have happened if Perot not entered the race in 92. Uh, but certainly, Republicans look still very good right up through 1991 on that. So. You know, Tom. I just want to say one thing about this seeming, some people see a contradiction in the Tea Party and the uh, nursing home thing. I mean, some of these ads that you hear on the radio say it's legal, moral, and ethical. So if the programs are out there and they're legal, moral, and ethical, uh, 
human nature and even the right thing to do, why wouldn't you take advantage of it? I don't see there's a contradiction between taking advantage of those on an individual basis for your family, especially if you worked hard and got your pension legally and some stupid politician told you, told they could give it to you into eternity, which they can't, and saying the system is screwed. It's, it, if we all do this forever, it's wrong, and I'm out campaigning and waving my flag to say let's change the system. But while it, it, I'm going to play by the rules as they are now, I mean, liberals want Tom more Palmer. taxes all the time. They don't Tom want to pay more the globe, taxes. Uh, Supposedly, they even give less to charities and things like that. So I, I don't see any. Yeah. I don't see any contradiction there on the, the criticism. Yeah. That no, we all we all say Social Security should be capped or means tested, but we all take the full Social Security when the checks come in. You just in the, at the elite level, you just had this example of stripping out food stamps and supporting agricultural subsidies for big agribusiness. That is the biggest single example of hypocrisy I've ever seen, mm -hmm. frankly. Yeah. And if you look at some of the Democrats who support these agricultural subsidies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was almost a perfect test case for a social scientist. Well, not yeah. necessarily, because we've had agricultural sub subsidies for a very long time, and the consequences of getting rid of them could be catastrophic for everybody. I mean, I agree it seems mm. to be a contradiction, but what are the consequences of reducing the food stamps, which have dramatically increased for a couple decades, and re reducing the the agricultural sub subsidies, which we've lived with for... Well, that's uh, that's the problem with all the libertarianism that people would like. It's, one side has interest groups and the other doesn't. And so every time you try to be consistently libertarian, some powerful force is going to say, no, we want that money. Well, yeah. Let me just add that. I don't necessarily agree with you on, on the agricultural subsidies. I think that if you really look at who's getting them at, at, at this point, it's the major agricultural uh, corporations, and it's not, you know, as in the Depression where it was your mom and pop was barely, uh, barely surviving. And beyond that, I think that the market forces have have pushed the price of uh, of, uh, of the food, uh, of the grain, and so forth. I, I don't know the answer to it. I'm just saying the consequences could be serious if we suddenly pull the rug. Yeah, I don't think it, I don't think it would. But okay, mm -hmm. I hope. If Mo doesn't want to comment on the fact that the nature of the people getting most of the agriculture su subsidies has changed over the decades, uh, uh, I'll ask the question that is in my mind. Uh, you, you said earlier that you think Obama frittered away the opportunity to build a permanent majority by listening too much to Rahm Emanuel and Nancy Pelosi, so the obvious question, what if he'd been listening to Mo Farina, what would you have advised him to do differently? Um, well, for one thing, it should have been focusing like a laser on jobs and the economy. It shouldn't have been health care, it shouldn't have been cap and trade. I mean, those were important issues to the Democratic base. Uh, but, and in, in the way they went about them, um, here, Rahm Emanuel is a partisan Democrat. He's one of those partisan Democrats to run, and so is Nancy Pelosi. They made, I mean, everybody talks about how the Republicans, oh, I have this in, no, I guess I don't have this in, uh, yes, I do, in the review essay. Yeah. Everybody talks about how DeMint and everybody, went, uh, McConnell went to a pure oppositional mode, but Woodward points out that all the early legislation was done completely within the Democratic caucus that there was no attempt to involve the Republicans whatsoever, and this before the rise of the Tea Party. So I don't know whether there, I mean, there was an opportunity, whether it was a good opportunity, I don't know, but they made no attempt uh, to, to look into that opportunity. I, 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 one of the things about Hoover is you get to talk now and then to a really high-level Republican, and I remember one coming in and saying, he'd talked to the House leadership and said, if Pelosi will give us three things, there will be votes for the health care bill if she'll give us malpractice reform so we can get back to the base and say, okay, we did something about these damn lawyers. If they'll give us insurance sales across state lines, and if they'll give us expanded health savings accounts, we can, we can say we got enough out of this legislation. And she, he said, Pelosi will give us nothing. So, I mean, it's if, you know, I, I think there were opportunities that had a more hands-on type Obama, but he's just clearly not a hands-on president and not a legislative technician, but a Johnson, as somebody, I, and I, I'm, believe me, Johnson lived in a, obviously in a completely different political system, but somebody who was a more hands-on legislative tactician, I think could have found a way uh, to do things, in, and it should have been a somewhat different agenda, and could have found a way to do things in a less partisan way, and at least, I think, 
didn't drive the Republicans off the cliff the way he did. Even with jobs, because mm -hmm. the consensus of many, I'm inclined to think that uh, no bigger um, stimulus or government spending could have gotten through that particular the Congress at the time. Uh, you really think he could have done a more effective job with the jobs creation issue that yeah. did him such harm? Yeah, I think he probably could have. I mean, just, yeah. That, that again, if you look at the details, it was it was not sort of oriented. I mean, so much about putting guys out in the street building stuff. It was it was building states out who couldn't make the public payrolls. We're going to have to delay people. I mean, um, no, I think it was they had a definite partisan cast to it. President who comes into office. And I just wonder, though, in response to your criticism of Obama, maybe you're in contradiction. I mean, maybe Obama says to himself, look, I'm not here to work on jobs. You know, I want it to be in 50 years. People look back at me the way they look back at the Great Society and LBJ. And they say, look, he brought health care. He changed the, the social nature of the whole country. And so, you know, and, and the economy will come back anyway. And, you know, there's cycles. And, I don't want to be a Bill Clinton who's credited because of the balance, but you know, that's not him. So he's very ambitious, and so he passes uh, Affordable Care Act. And, and so your criticism, it seemed like your criticism of him would have to rise to his ambition then, and wouldn't be enough to just. Yeah, but, but my understanding is there were various times when Obama was, uh, it was Pelosi who absolutely rammed it through, but Obama was willing to retreat on that several times. Wasn't that the case, health care experts? Uh, okay. the, the, yeah, you don't. Well, he let her. I mean, he let her write it. Yeah. Yeah. What they learned from the Clinton thing was you can't just drop a bill in Congress's lap. You have to let Congress take the lead so Congress feels a sense of ownership and fights when the bills get tough. And so that's why Pelosi. You know, a lot of the details were were let were you know they were trying not to do what happened in '94. I remember people at the time saying he was modeling himself on Reagan, because Reagan was always the one who had the big, was the big picture guy, and he left uh, other things. He had one or two things that he was going to insist on, and then everything else was uh, a small change. Yeah, but Reagan wheeled and dealed. Yeah, and he had people around him who were used to wheeling and dealing. Again, he also was a Southern Democrat. It was a different era. Yeah, it was a different era, different Congress. You know. Yeah. And, and the White House, the White House lobbyists actually knew the names of, of the Democratic Party people, which the current <laughs> current White House lobbyists apparently has never can't even recognize the head of the Appropriations Committee or the ranking member of the Appropriations Committee on the Republican side. Read that recently. My, my sense is that when they won, it was such a it was a big victory. There was a lot of talk uh, in the media community and even the academic community. This was a transformative election that the country had really finally turned to the left, the long national nightmare was over, and you know, basically it was gonna be a new era of progressive politics lasting a generation. And so I think, they, I think that sort of was behind what they, the agenda. And it, it was a misreading, as I said, of the, of the results, yeah. I mean, people desperately wanted to get rid of the Bush administration, absolutely, but didn't really sign on to sort of some completely new policy direction. But then when Scott Brown was elected, I think Rahm yeah. Emanuel actually advocated to President Obama to do the health care in a more incremental way. That was, that was my sense when I made the comment a few minutes ago that I, I remember it was Pelosi who said, no, we're going to do it this way now. And uh, Obama was sort of willing to waffle and sort of yeah, think about the other way. Is your Republican friend mm -hmm. Hoover who said all we need are these three things? Acknowledge that in fact the whole model was from Romney and from oh, Heritage before, yeah. and that at least one of those three things, crossing state lines, mm -hmm. is a total poison pill because mm -hmm. then it creates a race to the bottom mm -hmm. in health care insurance. I mean, mm -hmm. those are big concessions. Mm -hmm. They really would have gutted the bill. Yeah, also, also there was uh, some effort for bipartisan. There were fairly extended discussions in the Senate Finance Committee uh, between Grassley, uh, yeah. Grassley and Baucus, which went on for several months until they ultimately uh, collapsed. So, so I, I don't think it's quite accurate to say that it was 
Uh, they just simply delegated it to Pelosi. Mm -hmm. A lot of conservative pundits say that uh, this shutting down of the government could mean the end of the Republican Party for a long period of time. Uh, do you, I mean, and that would maybe usher in your one party uh, to transform the system. Do you think, uh, would you agree with those conservative pundits? No. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's funny, if you look at the polls, how few people are even aware of what's going on, that most people are not, uh, and, and actually, you can find people in polls that have majorities in favor of not raising the debt limit and, and cast the matter right <laughs> debt. So, I mean, I think this is, again, another thing where it's, it's, a, it's a big issue at the elite level, but until it actually hits, until they, I don't know whether the air traffic controllers at this time again, the parks close, et cetera, et cetera, the ordinary people aren't even going to be aware of what's going on. Right, but when they and do, like with uh, Newt Gingrich, it seemed to really hurt the Republicans. They seemed to overwhelm well, actually, their I, there was just, There's just an interesting article I read the other day that claims that that bit of popular, um, and I believe that certainly, but they, they claim it's not true. They, they looked at, uh, I think this is in the Monkey Cage, which is that blog that political scientists address a lot of. Um, real political things on. Um, just point out that the, um, first of all, Congress ratings were already going down and didn't show any particular change throughout that whole period. And then as the economy improved, both Congress and presidential ratings, and they, they argued that this really didn't have the effect that Clinton was elected. That basically, they, the economic forecasting models had Clinton's 96 election just about right. And so we, we built an elaborate story about the, what happened, a narrative, but they said if you actually look at the data, it's hard to find any any evidence for that? People have to see real impact to this shutdown before they think there's any. Or they have to hear about real Yeah, impact. real, yeah. It's not there yeah. for the yeah. media. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, uh, we have to stop, and uh, we want to thank you yeah. very much for coming. Thank you. Very, yeah. thank you. The, the, these were the kinds of questions I don't usually get in the standard American politics seminar where they want to know about this data point and how about that question was on the survey, et cetera, et cetera. So, no, no, so that was, that was very stimulating. Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah.